Welcome again, everyone. It's quite an honor to be able to give this talk on such a meaningful occasion. And throughout this lecture, I'll address real life socio-emotional encounters that multilinguals of immigrant or refugee background face when maintaining or simply using their mother tongues across different daily life situations. I very much hope that many of you here today will benefit from this lecture by relating it to some of the experiences that you possibly yourself encounter or hear about in your daily lives as multilingual speakers, parents, teachers, or researchers. Before I begin, I'd like to mention that so far I've been investigating multilingual development and practices across different disciplines and in various social contexts, such as family, school, workplace, and outside in community and in society in general. I designed today's lecture drawing on some of the interview findings from four different research projects that I've recently been involved in, in the Netherlands, in Norway, and in South Africa. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators here, Avon Nessa Torgerson, Anna Krulas, Marianne Christensen, and Christian Antonison, and as well as the participants of these projects for making this talk possible. Thank you all. Okay, here is a brief overview of what I'll cover in this uh, lecture. To begin, I'll illustrate and define the term socio-emotional processes and discuss some of the socio-emotional encounters of multilingualism in relation to immigrant, minority, or refugee experiences. Then I'll briefly mention some of the coping styles that different individuals adopt to deal with some of these negative socio-emotional encounters. From there, I'll illustrate these socio-emotional encounters and coping styles through interview excerpts from teachers teachers who teach in highly multilingual school in Norway, um, Turkish immigrant women living in Norway, Turkish immigrant women living in the Netherlands, and African immigrant women who work as a shopkeeper in Cape Town in South Africa. Finally, I'll conclude with some implications for practice for researchers, educators, and multilingual families. Here we go. I'll begin with an anecdote to illustrate the primary motivation of today's lecture. Two years ago, probably you heard about that during the 19, uh, 91st Annual Academy Awards, on the red carpet, Mexican actor Diego Luna spoke Spanish and said that we can speak Spanish at the Oscars now. I'm hearing Spanish all around, which is lovely. After that event, the award-winning Mexican author Reina Granda, who was born in Mexico and came to the US as an undocumented child immigrant, wrote an article. She expressed the social and emotional challenges she went through while growing up as an immigrant child in the US. The pressures and challenges caused her almost to lose her mother tongue Spanish, which was almost fully replaced by English, and that nearly ruined her bond with her mother. I'm going to read her experiences in school, but as I read this, please pay attention to emotional challenges that she faced in response to social injustice, inequalities, ignorance, and isolation. Here we go. It was empowering for me to hear the unapologetic use of my mother tongue at the Oscars. And it made me think about my childhood, when instead of pride, I was made to feel shame, when instead of a door being opened, an invisible wall was erected, when instead of being celebrated, my mother tongue was degraded. On my first day at a school, US school, upon realizing that I didn't speak a word of English, my fifth grade teacher pointed to the farthest corner of her classroom and sent me there. She ignored me for the rest of the year. The message I received was that if I wanted to be seen or heard, I'd have to speak English. As I sat in that corner, day after day invisible, the trauma of realizing that I spoke the wrong language weighed on me and my head swam with debilitating thoughts. 
I am broken, I am wrong, I'm not enough. As I grew up, the shame I felt about my mother tongue eventually drove a wedge between me and my mother, who never learned English. As my siblings and I became English proficient and finally English dominant, we began to reject our mother and everything she represented. My siblings and I spoke English all the time. And as the years passed, we both consciously and unconsciously excluded our mother from all our conversations and eventually from our middle-class American lives. You can find, the, um, find re the rest of this um, wonderful story, enlightening article online on CNN. But here, this is an overview of all the negative social and emotional experiences that Raina Grande was exposed to. All in all, all these social and emotional factors prevented her from teaching Spanish to her children. Her children couldn't communicate with their grandmother, which gave Raina regret later, until she one day decided to fix it and got out of that vortex. This anecdote very well illustrates how social and emotional processes work together in affecting decision-making on whether to maintain or abandon a mother term by setting up a chain reaction, which explains why I choose to use the term socio-emotional. It refers to intricately intertwined social and emotional factors that impact on mother tongue development and multilingual skills. Just to give you a brief definition of socio-emotional processes that I'll address in this talk, it is the combined influence that emotional factors and the surrounding social environment have on individuals' physical and mental wellness and their ability to learn and function in society. So these processes have effects not only on our well-being across the lifespan, but also on our ability to acquire language. And this evidence on, uh, uh, come from educational and social psychology, indicating what goes on in the minds of individuals can facilitate or inhibit language learning processes. In order to influence these processes in a positive way, we need to build a social support, a caring climate, and a need supportive learning environment. So when we look at today's topic and focus, focus on today's world, it's still a fact that we live in an uncertain world in which many multilinguals are becoming more vulnerable than ever and at risk of experiencing their multilingual life conflictedly rather than harmoniously, and as a curse rather than a gift. We certainly recognize that multilingualism is lived as an asset for some while as a burden for others. On top of that, war, conflict, non-solidarity, anti-diversity, racism, authoritarianism, widening poverty gaps are still on the rise in the world. So emotional and social challenges certainly arise in relation to such heavy conflicts. In addition, with or without being aware of it, well-intentioned or not, the vast majority of people around the world still participate every day in committing linguistic genocide for various reasons and through various channels, such as ideological, political, social, economic, pedagogical, or individual. Specifically in educational context, the benefits of learning through mother tongues were recognized as early as 1957 in the UNESCO Declaration, which explicitly stated the right of every individual to grow up with, get educated in, and speak their mother tongue wherever they reside. Numerous studies highlighted the pedagogical, cognitive, social, and emotional benefits of developing skills in the mother tongue. Although, in principle, 
all these rights, uh, rights and benefits have been recognized in practice, especially teachers working in multilingual settings find it difficult to implement pedagogies that meet the need of linguistically diverse and multilingual classrooms. Additionally, both in an outside school, in everyday lives, most multilingual speakers encounter socio-emotional pressures that cause their mo mo mother tongue to be overshadowed or silenced by the power and prestige of the majority languages. Linguistic inequality in many contexts still leads to social justice, uh, social prejudice, injustice, and cultural stereotypes associated with the linguistic and sociocultural status of ethnic minorities. This is devastating for many multilinguals because it usually places them in a socio-emotional limbo where their mother tongue is no longer as a tool of thought or expression. This socio-emotional limbo often leads to linguistic insecurity and negative self-image, shame, anxiety, or even trauma. Also aggressive monolingualism is still prevalent both in and outside schools. And, it, and it's especially evident in immigrant or minority settings where multilinguals are often evaluated on monolingual standards and judged negatively in society based on standard norms or level of so-called nativeness. As Professor Lourdes Ortega directs our attention to the fact that when speaking of inequalities and multilingualism, race always matters. The year is 2021. Xenophobia is still spreading like wildfire in many parts of the world, and people who speak a minority language or less prestigious language are still being attacked either physically or verbally. This happens almost in any country of the world. Here in Norway, for instance, last year, an old elderly person who could not stand the sound of the Sami language on the bus attacked a 20-year-old Sami Norwegian bilingual. Also with the rise of discrimination against Syrian refugees in Turkey, an Egyptian actor who works as a stuntman in Istanbul was hospitalized after being badly bitten by a man in the middle of the street, just because he was mistaken for a Syrian refugee and he spoke Arabic with his sister. Well, these photos are from South Africa, a very diverse and multilingual country, which is still hit by waves of violent attacks against African immigrants. In one of these photos, you see a little boy with one roller blade passing by a pile of burning furniture after their own neighbor destroyed their belongings and reported that they were sanitizing the area. To recap this section, the importance of the mother tongue in the multilingual development and thereby maintaining it has been accepted and highlighted in the literature or, or in politics, wherever. But in practice, many immigrant minority or refugee communities still encounter heavy socio-emotional strains and only some of which are listed here. Now, the question is, how are such emotional, socio-emotional challenges deal with? And how do different coping styles influence mother tongue maintenance and multilingual development? I'll focus on two different styles, avoidance and resilience, since they were most common in the current data. Starting with avoidance coping, which involves cognitive and behavioral efforts such as denying, ignoring, minimizing, or otherwise avoiding dealing directly with stressful demands. Avoidance may actively promote new stressors and generates further distress and depression, such as when emotional discharge 
aggravate strengths in family or work relationships. So it may negatively affect the caring climate and need supportive environment, which facilitate language learning and socio-emotional processes that I mentioned earlier. For instance, recent research on Turkish immigrants in the Netherlands indicate that by virtue of avoidance, multilinguals are caught in a vicious circle when anxiety um, as a socio-emotional challenge is dealt with uh, avoidance. So avoidance leads to less language use. This leads to lower language comp uh, competence, which again results in more anxiety and more avoidance, especially for the younger generation of the community. Also, this vicious circle of anxiety and avoidance causes further problems in terms of conflict and identities, identity-related shame or social isolation. Moving on to resilience now, well, um, the term here refers to our ability to adapt to stressful situations or crises. It's actually the ability of rolling with the punches. And the empir empirical evidence from positive psychology support that as a situation modification strategy, positive emotions play a fundamental role in this ability of stress or emotional resilience. Positive emotions such as humor, love, joy, or pride have counterbalancing effects on negative emotional experiences. On the other hand, a deficit in positive emotions can trigger vulnerability to stress and trauma. When we look at language learning situations, a recent development in the field of psychology of language learning reveals that positive emotions such as enjoyment, foster language learning, motivate students to try new things, invoke their imagination and social interaction. Again, in this volume, Professor Dewell and McIntyre discussed the role of enjoyment and anxiety in classroom settings. They address that the more students enjoy learning a foreign language, the better they master it. Additionally, enjoyment builds resilience, decreasing the level of anxiety. Very innovative, well-needed interdisciplinary development in the field. I'm a big fan of it, but one of its limitations is that Scholars in psychology of language learning do not specifically focus on multilingual students with refugee or immigrant background. Also, they do not address their emotions in relation to their real life or previous life socio-emotional challenges outside the classroom, such as trauma, racism, inequalities that those students may also experience in their daily lives. Okay. Now I'll share some of the examples from different social contexts, such as school, family, workplace, and outside in society. In the school context, I'll discuss some of the interview excerpts from language teachers who teach in a multilingual primary school in Norway, which serves newly arrived refugee and immigrant students. In the family context, We'll see a few examples from Turkish immigrant mothers living in the Netherlands and Turkish immigrant mothers living in Norway. As for the context of workplace and outside in society, we'll hear the voices of African immigrant women working as a shopkeeper in shopping mall in Cape Town in South Africa. And again, of Turkish immigrant women in the Netherlands. In conclusion, Drawing on these diverse contexts and voices, I'd like to uh, address some implications for practice for researchers, schools, and families. Multilingualism is still a daily life burden rather than a resource for social justice, education, pride, or joy. Socio-emotional challenges of various daily life contexts still overweigh advantages and appreciation of mother tongues for many multilinguals, their parents or teachers. 
Some people respond to these challenges by simply avoiding them and give it, giving up on their mother tongues, while others show resilience. Challenges and inequalities are, 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 are unfortunately inevitable, but whether or not we can stand up for our rights and our well being is up to our resilience. Therefore, as researchers, first of all, our goal should be to incorporate social justice in our research and daily lives by inspiring and encouraging multilinguals to be resilient and to stand up for their rights. In addition, for a better understanding and management of socio-emotional challenges in multilingual contexts that focus on psychology or psychology of language learning is beneficial. However, a special attention on sociolinguistics or sociology is benefit, beneficial for a better understanding and in, investigation of these socio-emotional strains, for instance, by addressing social injustice and inequalities both in and outside the classroom. We as the teacher educators or researchers should also underline the need for pedagogical support for teachers, as well as for collaboration between schools and universities. Finally, media support and, uh, media support and publication public dissemination of our research is remarkably essential to legitimate diversity, language variation, and multilingualism. In schools, first of all, social and psychological support should be provided both for teachers and for multilingual students who are exposed to daily negative socio-emotional experiences. Clearly, sometimes socio-emotional challenges arise in the classroom from pedagogical challenges, but also from the fact that teachers approach multilingual children's ethnicity as a taboo, which is closely linked to ignorance and uncaring climate. Therefore, schools must invest in teacher professional development in multilingual learning environments to support the linguistically and multiculturally responsive teaching. Also in implementing multilingual practices, schools should better understand the importance of socio-emotional process, processes and skills to multilingual students' long-term success and their well-being. As early as primary school, schools should implement classes in their curricula by building on research, recent research and evidence about the importance of psychology of language learning and socio-emotional learning skills, such as perseverance and resilience. Finally, a couple of suggestions for families here to follow the blogs and studies on family language policy. This is the first volume that brings together the micro, meso, and macro level research on social and emotional factors in home language maintenance, including family language policies and practices. You can also follow our center director, Elizabeth Lanza's blog on psychology today, or Facebook events such as Raising Multilinguals Live. However, one warning here, please just do not base your parenting on a cookie cutter approach. Pay attention to individual differences and remember that Every multilingual family or parent-child relationship is unique and in many ways incomparable to other multilingual families. Tune into your children, enhance resilience and minim minimize conflict. Follow what the child needs by building a need supportive, caring climate, image, well-being, resilience, Tolerance and respect for diversity are viewed as a key value to overcoming challenges. It's easier said than done, we know, but most importantly, take charge and take care of your well-being. 
We need all emotions, either positive or negative. We are human after all, but just don't bombard yourself or your children with blame, anxiety, or ignorance all the time. Socio-emotional challenges are inevitable. Prepare yourself and your children to face and overcome these challenges. So thank you very much. And I'm very much looking forward to your comments or questions. So I'm a member of Novel Project, L2 Communication Among Polish Migrants in Norway, but I'm looking at different aspects of communication between Polish employees and their Norwegian customers, patients and colleagues. So, uh, an L2 speaking doctor in Norwegian healthcare, expectations, domains and challenges. Let's kick it off. Here comes our plan. So, we're going to start with uh, disentangling the very notion of medical uh, language and uh, looking at features that are typical of it. Uh, sorry, <laughs> here it comes. So medical uh, language as such first, and then we're going to look at some features that are typical of Norwegian medical language. Then we're going to look at um, some skills, some particular language skills that are uh, expected of uh, physicians. Uh, different domains and settings, and then at possible challenges that an um, L2 uh, speaking jokes might experience here in Norway. And then um, just to round up, we're going to be, uh, you're going to be presented some real life examples. So let's start with um, disentangling this medical language. What's in it? Well, it's a very specific jargon uh, which we need or which the physicians need in order to be able to talk precisely and describe our body, its elements, uh, parts of the body, organs, uh, their precise location, uh, but also processes um, that happen there and conditions that affect it. And uh, least but not last, all the procedures performed uh, upon it. And it has to be as precise, as detailed as possible, right? So now that we know what the medical language is, let's proceed to uh, what's typical of uh, Norwegian medical language. Well, Mike can say, or one can say that medical language in a way is international as it contains many uh, words from Latin and Greek and it is intuitive at least to those who master the language like being medical stuff. Um, however there are some um, there are some words um, that might pose a challenge uh, to, to uh, doctors performing the practice in L2 language and now speaking about uh, several low frequent words. We've got words like seponera, syncopera, reponera, or homeostasa. Um, and I don't think that a regular human being not being interested in, in, in medicine knows what they mean. So just to, uh, to help you out, seponera is when you stop using a drug, taking a drug. Syncopera means basically to faint. Uh, reponera to reposition bones after a fracture and homostasa is um, a physiological balance of the body. And now I've mentioned that um, the existence of Latin and Greek components or words uh, is typical of uh, medical language as such. But what we find in Norwegian is a Norwegian twist. Uh, and what I mean by that is that uh, some of the words have been domest domesticated. And in this way, uh, hepatitis became hepatite. And then we've got several combination of uh, Latin as such, or uh, using like um, entire elements from Latin, uh, which is characteristic of uh, fields like radiology, for instance, where one is, uh, talks about cancer pulm, certa uh, columna, uh, but we have also combinations of Norwegian and Latin words like röntgen, abdomen, instead of mage, uh, röntgen. Uh, so cancer is um, a cancer in your lungs. Seate columna is a computer tomography of your uh, spine. And röntgen, abdomen, that's uh, uh, imagining of your stomach, basically. So many words have been domesticated, uh, given uh, Norwegian spelling, or at least endings. Right. Um, 
and further it goes because we have uh, several um, everyday phrases that get new meaning as that are used in uh, new contexts like patienten står eller går på smarte stillene the patient is standing or going on painkillers and then we've got several abbreviation and acronyms and some of them are international some of them are not so we've got like pass which stands for patient a patient uh, temp temperatur temperature then we've got bc blodtryck so blood pressure not that international ohjälp which stands for emergency GSC, which is Glasgow Coma Scale International. And then we've got two abbreviation, uh, PIROS or intravenous. PIROS uh, means oral intake and intravenous uh, means uh, infusion or injection. What's uh, typical of the written language is that there are very few verbs, which might be confusing, especially with doctors who are uh, beginning their career in Norway and speaking Norwegian, and prodrop in writing, meaning uh, that we skip subject. And uh, here we've got some uh, real life examples from a uh, um, patient journal or patient documentation, Lege Journal, that's what it says here. And indeed, we've, what we find is uh, ultra short descriptions, prodrops, so skipping the subject. And this is very problematic because as a learner of Norwegian, one of the first things you learn is that each Norwegian sentence has to contain a subject. So that might seem confusing. Then you've got incomplete verb phrases, which might be difficult as well. Medical terms, but of course, uh, abbreviations and passive voice a lot of passive voice in Norwegian. Now let's have a look who uses medical Norwegian. We've got of course physicians like everyone uh, starting from those who just graduated from the studies uh, up to how profiles uh, specialists. We've got nurses and midwives and paramedics those who drive around in ambulance uh, healthcare workers, health uh, uh, and the previous name was Yelpe uh, Flyera, sorry, uh, therapists and health secretaries. So you can see the number is pretty big and uh, the community itself is very varied. Now, why should we look at medical language and uh, medical universe uh, as, as such uh, from a second language perspective here in Norway? Well the, well, the thing is that here in Norway, there's been a great demand of uh, health care workers in several years. And there's a need for both physicians, nurses and other um, health care workers. Uh, and this is partly because the capacity of Norwegian um, um, universities is pretty limited. There are some uh, doctors who have their uh, education from abroad, but there's still a great demand. So what we have to do here in Norway is to import uh, medical force or medical health uh, care workers from abroad. And this equates to many doctors speaking L2 Norwegian or the varieties of two L2 Norwegian. And this is required of them in order to uh, be able to practice, in order to get employed in a Norwegian health service, you need to speak English. Uh, you need to speak English, yes, that's, uh, that, that's a good thing, but you need to speak uh, Norwegian to, to be able to communicate with patients and your colleagues. And there is something specific about the input you receive here in Norway, being a um, learner of uh, Norwegian as a doctor, because the um, reality at the hospital is very varied, as I mentioned. So what you meet or whom you meet are doctors from Denmark, uh, sticking to their uh, mother tongue, uh, Danish. You've got many Swedish doctors um, speaking Swedish, and you've got all these varieties of L2 Norwegians from all over the world plus a great variety of Norwegian um, dialects, which differ in, in respect to grammar, uh, vocabulary, but also pronunciation. And now that's the situation where one has to embrace being a doctor here in Norway. But the thing is that you don't learn, learn it overnight. So it takes some time and it might pour some uh, confusion and frustration at the very beginning, because being a learner of a new language, what you need is a stable reality. So you need um, this one-to-one -one equivalency. You have to know that if 
you've got one word for black, one word for big, and so on. And what you need in your uh, hospital reality is, is a great marriage of uh, different variations, not only dialects, but also languages. And it happens that sometimes you hear a word or see a phrase, and you don't actually know, you don't actually know uh, if you don't understand it because you just don't know the phrase, or if the phrase is, it comes from another language. So that's a challenging uh, stars. Uh, right, and the situation is not going to get any better, um, at least if we are to uh, believe the prognosis, they are pretty pessimistic. So in 2035, there will be 5,500 doctors missing. So uh, probably we have to do something about this situation in order to, uh, makes it more, uh, to make it more smooth for those who come in order to treat Norwegian patients. And again, for Norwegian patients to feel uh, safe and to feel embraced. Now, if we talk about um, language skills, it's um, a traditional way we can divide them into um, receptive skills, is if, that mean, meaning uh, comprehending what you hear and what you, what you read, and productive skills, what you produce yourself uh, when talking and writing. And these two types uh, intervene with each other, they coexist and then they depend on each other. The thing is that when it comes to uh, productive skills, you can somehow control what you say, what you write, because you are in a way restricted of this repertoire you have. So you have a limited number of words, you have a limited number of structures, and you can stick to it and feel pretty safe. I mean, you can feel that you can't express everything, but at least you've mastered something. Whereas when it comes to receptive skills, um, you can't really predict what you'll be exposed to. So it might happen that you're exposed to phrases, to words you don't understand. And this is something that can make you insecure as a learner. And of course, it's, it, it gets better with some time. But at the very start, it might seem um, um, distracting or frustrating, uh, not helping you out. Uh, right. When we talk about language skills, it's usually to talk about oral and written skills. And there are several different domains and situations where a doctor has to attune the language according to, or depending on what kind of situation it is, depending on whom or what he or he deals with. And there are situations that require slightly different structures. So if you take an analysis where you have to investigate what kind of symptoms a doctor has, uh, not a doctor, but a patient has, and how the uh, disease has developed, you have to be very precise in asking questions. You have to master use of grammatical tests as well, in order to be able to put the very development of the disease on the timeline and then suggest a treatment based on what you've heard. Then you've got examination and simple procedures that require slightly different structures because here you, you have to give instructions, you have to tell the patient what happens next, what he or she might expect um, that is going to um, tickle or that um, is going to be cool, so you might feel this, you might feel that. Um, and it's, you're much more tight on the patient. And then you've got a uh, ward round uh, when you talk to uh, patients who are already admitted to the hospital and staying in the beds, probably. So what you have to do is to provide information on the condition. You have to gain new information, asking about what, how they feel and so. And then you have to, um, Yes, to, you have to use a regular teacher so that the patients feel that they are taken care of and, uh, and seen um, and embraced um, by the situation. And then you've got release from the hospital. Um, and again, loads of information in a very structured way uh, and informing a, about a bad prognosis. Now, you have to be very precise, you have to be very professional, but at the same time, you have to be compassionate in order not to make this um, information more harsh than it should be. So here is a very a fine balance between being professional and finding words uh, to make it seem exact as it should. Uh, as it should. Then you've got uh, talking to relatives who are uh, often agitated or affected by other conditions. Um, often there are many at the same time you have to relate to, so, that, so that's, um, uh, that's a challenging situation again. And these uh, I've mentioned now, uh, this situation I've mentioned now, are more like 
talking to a patient, talking to a humane um, um, or very humane situation when you make where you don't use so professional language but more uh, laid back language. Uh, whereas in the next three, where you attend courses and seminars, when you present things for your colleagues, where you have to consult uh, your colleagues uh, about certain uh, things, procedures, patients, whatsoever, um, that's a space for using more professional language. So you don't have to, uh, you can actually rely on things you know from other languages or more uh, international, because using a concert pill won't be any uh, challenge for others to understand. And then you've got uh, telephone consultations, both with colleagues and patients. And they are challenging um, for a um, second language language learner as such, because all you have to rely on, all you have to rely on is uh, one modality, meaning voice. You can't see uh, anyone shake their head or nod their heads, or you can't see gestures or mimics. So you have the voice and the line is not always good so there's an additional challenge to it and now if you look at the have a look at the right bottom corner uh, you've got several words um, meaning peeing or connected to peeing and now um, being a doctor learning learning Norwegian you can uh, choose to stick to diurasa which is more international and something familiar for you for other languages uh, but talking to patients require that you also um, understand more common words like tissa. So although you can choose what you, uh, and sometimes you have to attune to the patient who doesn't understand what diurasa means, right? So you have to uh, cover all the register, all the varieties of words required of you, both more professional or more uh, humane, so to say. Right, um, these were oral skills. And then we've got written skills. There's a lot of writing in uh, hospital reality. And again, uh, different documents uh, require certain structures, a structure of text itself, but also phrases and um, how you structure thoughts, how you structure descriptions in them. So you've got things like patient rec records, you've got admission notes, epicrisis, operation notes, uh, release notes, doctor certificates, and again, that differs from country to country, so you have to uh, apply the new uh, pattern, uh, which is applicable here in Norway. And then when it comes to receptive skills, you have all laws, regulations, and guidelines that you have to read and comprehend, right? Okay, now in many uh, Norwegian hospitals, if not in all, uh, people uh, try to make um, work time effective. So what they use is, I can never remember what the name is in English, but let me, uh, let me have a look here. Yes, so they use speech converter that changes spoken voice into computer readable text. And this is time effective as long as your pronunciation is good enough for the device to recognize your voice. Very often it's not. So what I know uh, many doctors do is to take the notes first and then read it and record it, dictate it. So it's all but uh, time efficient uh, when it's done this way. All right, let's Let's now have a wrap up on uh, challenges um, that um, um, L2 speaking doctor might encounter in the Norwegian uh, healthcare system and what consequences they may lead to. So understanding Norwegian is a challenge uh, in itself. We've got many regions, many dialects um, with different grammar, different pronunciation, different vocab to some extent, um, at least. We've got old patients who not always enunciate, um, rather mumble than enunciate in many cases. We've got people using their own language. For example, there are some people who are fond of metaphors, um, so idiolects, and then different health conditions. It's pretty difficult to talk to someone who, who's suffering, who's in pain, right? And then talking on the phone. And what it leads to, or what it may lead to, is that we provide imprecise information. If we don't know a precise word, we prefer to leave it out. If in doubt, leave it out. Uh, we provide insufficient, imprecise information or oversimplified information and under-reporting. 
And there has been a, a study on how um, nurses speaking Norwegian as the first language and second language report. Um, and the main finding is that um, although they do manage to both groups manage to convey the numerical information on the patient's um, um, param basic parameters, for instance, there are some nuances um, that do not, um, that, are, that can't be conveyed if you lack words, if you're short of words. So um, nurses speaking Norwegian as a first language were much more uh, diligent or much more uh, precise when it comes to um, describing uh, different uh, conditions. Now, is it surprising? Not really, because we know that speaking L2, uh, speaking a second language has its limitations. We don't have the entire repertoire we have from the, uh, that we have in uh, our first language. If it can be dangerous, well, in some cases, probably yes. Whereas you can rely on different modalities. You can watch the patient and his or her reactions, or you can get some extra questions um, where he or she asks you to uh, be less ambiguous um, about uh, your answer, uh, it's not always the case. I mean, patients not always dare to ask additional questions and sometimes their condition is so bad or they are so effective that they don't really care that they just uh, leave it as it is. As it is. And now uh, I've got two short uh, extracts from a conversation carried out by um, a doctor speaking L2 in Norwegian and a Norwegian patient. Uh, the doctor is real, the patient is not, so we've got a role-playing game here. And what you see here is a very rough translation of a voice recording translated to English, um, and I try to make it as appropriate as possible. So let's have a look. What, what happens here is that the entire conversation is a nine-minute conversation, and it goes rather smooth, because if the patient is in doubt, she asks additional questions and uh, she, goes, uh, she, she gets an immediate answer. But there are two situations where the answer is not clear and you find some phrases that are self-contradictory and here the patient investigates if if it was a heart attack or not so what the real condition is so it's not a heart attack no um i can't see the i can't see the uh entire dialogue here okay uh, so it's not a heart attack. No, in a way it may be. One can say mild heart attack, but it's very small. Hmm. Uh, but it's not the same as people have. It's just that the virus effect, uh, affects heart muscle. Hmm. So you can see that, okay, is it or is it not? I mean, uh, and we can discuss if it's a doctor being uncertain what the condition is, or if it's a lack of words that leads to this uh, uh, um, not clear uh, answer. And further, the patient tr is trying to investigate if the condition is over or if it's permanent. And again, although she does um, get uh, an answer at the end, it's, it doesn't actually match uh, the, the real question. So is it, a, is it permanent damage? Um, no, usually it's not, it is not permanent, and it usually, it can be serious, but it usually, it is not serious, uh, and it is usually, it is viral infection that affects the heart, and it is in a way self-limiting self afterwards. Okay, self, yes, yes, uh, so has it gone away? Yes, it will go away. So it's not gone. I mean, we're not done with it, right? So there is a slightly imprecision here. Okay, and now what can we do about it? And um, as I mentioned before, the picture is not going to change. So the health service in Norway is going to last as it is with many doctors speaking L2 um, Norwegian. And what we can do, uh, one idea, it's my idea, it's pretty fresh and I don't actually know how to implement it, but uh, maybe raising metalinguistic or at least uh, linguistic awareness uh, in the entire uh, society on the general level uh, is an answer to that. Making patients more aware um, and alert uh, of what difficulties talking to L2 doctor might entail could possibly open for more understanding and awareness when patients use their Norwegian. Um, and, but then you've got the question, is it really 
uh, decent to expect of people who are affected by difficult conditions, health conditions, to attune the language, to make it more simple for doctor who, uh, who should understand it, and that's what's expected. And I think I'll leave you with this question. Um, thank you very much for your uh, attention. I'll be delighted to address all the questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Yashin, for coordinating and moderating, Michaela for hosting, Liz for chairing, Yashin, Olivia, and Ellie for the talks, and thank everyone for coming. We now move from Olivia's medical setting to a family setting. This talk has two parts. In the first part, we will talk about infant and early childhood development and specifically how children see this world. In the second part, we will discuss how environments affect how they see this world. Okay. Humans' early development involves the expansion of cognitive abilities, such as attention, memory, and the expansion of word knowledge, from how we interact with things, with people, to learning to walk, learning to talk. However, it might surprise you that there are also regressive events, depending on what infants experience from the environment. The language experience of a child determines how they hear and speak languages, not only their mother or father languages, but also other languages. In English and Norwegian, la and ra are different sounds, but in Japanese, there's no such distinction. So to Japanese speakers, learning, to difference, learning the difference between la and ra is actually a challenge. Patricia Ku and colleagues showed that this is not a challenge in the beginning of life for infants learning English or learning Japanese, but quickly, Becoming, become challenging at the end of the first year for Japanese infants. The challenge continues to adulthood if there's no, uh, if there's a continuous absence of the la ra exposure. Similarly, a child's experience with race affects how they see faces from an unfamiliar race. Giselle Enzure and colleagues did a study on Caucasian infants' perception of Asian faces. They first habituate infants on one face and then show them two faces. If the baby can tell that the two faces are different, they would focus on the new face because it's new information and babies like new information. Otherwise, they would look at the two faces equally. In this study, younger Caucasian infants can tell the difference, but older infants cannot. Can you tell the difference? That means I can be very handsome in my race, but you cannot tell, but that's okay. But jokes aside, think about the racial conflicts nowadays. Maybe there is an indirect way to resolve this from the beginning of life. This is a bit far. Just hold that thought and let's come back to the topic. In another study, Lisa Scott and colleagues tested infant sensitivity to animal faces. Younger infants can tell the difference, but older infants cannot. However, when they give monkey names and let parents talk about these monkeys in stories, older infants keep their sensitivity to monkey faces. I think after this talk, you will see other animals quite differently. These studies are for faces, races, and species. In the first talk, we heard from Yashim about positive and negative emotional factors. What about emotion development in infancy and early childhood? Researchers have not reached a consensus even till today on human emotion perception and development. Some believe our ability to perceive basic emotions are innate. Others argue that our understanding of detailed emotions are established through experience through time. Having said that, there's no doubt that infants are sensitive to positive emotions like happiness and negative emotions like anger. From an evolutionary perspective, infants are drawn to happiness, but also need to know when danger comes, right? To summarize, unlike the stubborn, sometimes, sometimes stupid us, or maybe just me, probably just me, infants are designed to be adaptive, to be optimal in the beginning of life. Such adaptability leaves infants with the ability to integrate auditory, visual, multisensory information together but relevant to their environment. So basically, this is a human version of Charles Darwin's survival of the fittest. Now we come to the second part, 
as Liz pointed out in the beginning of the program hosted by UNESCO, the theme of this year's International Mother's Language Day is fostering multilingualism for inclusion in education and society. In this talk, we focus on multilingualism and society, social environment. For kids whose mother languages are more than Norwegian, where this more complex environment affects how they view this world, affects how they view this world. Okay. On the surface, growing up in a bilingual environment typically brings more knowledge from language to cultures, uh, give them uh, more information. On top of that, studies have shown that complex environment appears to have benefits on infants' language learning, cognitive development, social understanding, cultural awareness, etc., etc. In other words, they become even more adaptive and more flexible. This is not only shown on a behavioral level. A neuroanatomical data such as cortical gray matter correlates with age of acquisition in a bilingual brain. So some recent studies argue for a relationship between bilingual language proficiency and genes involved in dopamine. So research suggests that bilingual babies have a more flexible brain. That, that sounds very nice. However, there are different voices on that. There are heated debates on whether a monolingual environment will lead to better cognitive abilities. Some say yes, some say no. Our multilingual professor Mina Litton had a meta-analysis on that topic. They did not find a relationship as such. So people start to rethink this issue from different angles. Our next speaker, Ellie, introduced me to a recent workshop hosted by the National Institute on Aging. One presenter, Erica Hoff, asked an interesting question. If there is a cognitive advantage that some children have and others don't. So rather than the multilingual debate, it's, it's come to if there is an advantage, uh, what, what type of bilinguals show that advantage? She did a study on that. And what they found was that vocabulary size, for example, is the key attribute to be linked with children's cognitive benefits, but only among bilinguals, not all monolinguals. Another rethinking point is the scope, because multilingualism is essentially about languages and many times more diverse cultural input in, in, the, in the early childhood setting. So maybe the benefit is more domain specific rather than across domains. We come back to a study linking multilingualism and emotion. We did a recent study on whether infants can detect racial and cultural information in facial expressions. If we have two mothers from the same cultural background, but different races, for example, between a Caucasian looking Norwegian mother and an Asian looking Norwegian mother, will babies know that they are from the same culture? And if we have two mothers from the same race, but different cultural backgrounds, for example, between an Asian looking Norwegian mother and a Japanese mother, will baby notice the cultural differences in the embedded in the emotion? So our study in Australia found that infants with biracial experience, so multiracial experiences, are more sensitive than those with monoracial experiences to cross to cross racial and cross cultural emotion expressions. Interestingly, monolingual versus bilingual experience do not yield a difference. So this can be an indication that specific language experience leads to specific type of sensitivity, maybe, but we are not entirely sure. If we don't find something, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist, such as aliens, we just don't, we just don't know. <laughs> the safe thing to say is that if you give your baby a diverse racial experience, they get more sensitive to emotion perception across race, across culture. So Netflix is right, after all, introducing racial diversity to us. But back to the topic, we are now running this study in Norway and see what the results will look like with Norwegian babies. So now our take home messages are, first, Experience is the key to child development 
and also to human life, which I guess is essentially an experience. Uh, second, the same as above and on many levels, not just cognitive development, but like personality, health, everything is influenced by experience, of course. And third, learning helps from the beginning to the end, or should I say, find something to make your brain work uh, and please find something good. <laughs> and that will definitely help, be helpful. Now, commercial break. We have two projects running at the moment. One is uh, how culture, as I mentioned, a broad concept is learned by babies. And if multilingual babies are more flexible in foreign culture perception. So here we, we not only uh, capture the multilingual background, but also the multicultural background and multiracial experiences. And we have another project on whether or not babies can learn Cantonese and if multilingual babies are more flexible when hearing this new language. Thank you very much. If you know anyone who knows anyone who has a child younger than 12 months, please let us know about us. The pandemic is difficult for everyone and the scientific community is no escape. So thank you in advance for spreading the message and contributing to science. Thank you. Mm, well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for being here today. It's really, really, really a pressure after this year. Um, so today we've heard a lot about the complexities of being a multilingual speaker and how challenging it can be. Um, but we've also heard a lot about resilience and that's really where I want to focus on uh, this ending talk for today. So, I don't think I need to remind you that it's been exactly a year since the pandemic started officially um, here in Norway. And I wonder how many of us can remember when we were just able to live our lives without thinking too much about the consequences of our actions, uh, but it's definitely been something that has changed a lot. Uh, and so it's been quite a year. It's been a year full of unexpected events, uh, tragedy and pain. And little did we know that we were gonna go from something like this very quickly into something like that. And so for many of us uh, present here, many of us listening in the audience, um, those at first glimpse innocent blue spots uh, have meant really invisible prisons um, that have prevented us from seeing our loved ones uh, and also have made it impossible to return somewhere where we feel that we belong. And this word of uh, belonging, this concept of belonging, it's a, it's a pretty difficult one to explain and to uh, reflect on. I'm sure that if I ask any of you, uh, what, what you, how do you, would you define belonging, uh, you would have a hard time with it. Um, but I recently came across this quote uh, from Maya Angelou in the 70s uh, in a book from Brené Brown. And she talks about belonging in this way. So she says, you're only free when you realize you belong no place. You belong every place, no place at all. The price is high, the reward is great. And so to be honest, at first I wasn't uh, too excited about this quote. I was almost bothered by it because after nearly a, a decade of being away from home myself, um, I certainly feel that there are places uh, where I belong and there are people that I belong with. But then I reflected a little bit more on it. And as a linguist, um, language, identity, and belonging are part of the same construct to me. Um, after all, language and identity is what I do. And so for many of us uh, here in the audience today, the meaning of home can sometimes be a bit blurred. We've heard today about how identity can be a multifaceted concept for those of us whose place of birth, upbringing, language and even race is different from that of the people that surround us or from the place where we're currently living. And all of these ideas, all of these concepts can be referred to as heritage. Um, and languages that are passed on through generations within a family context are also referred to as heritage languages. Languages that pass on one's identity, culture, and sense of belonging. 
So in the midst, in the midst of the biggest crisis that many of us have probably suffered and experienced, um, where a simple trip home could not bring about feelings of belonging. We wonder about how multilingual families in Norway, families that have a multicultural background, um, were experiencing the, the, the effects of the pandemic in their own skins. And that's what brought us to uh, the study that I'm going to talk about a little bit today, uh, which is a study on uh, and language in multilingual families during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so we, you know, we really wanted to, to understand uh, these effects in multilingual families. But before I, I go ahead, um, I really need to uh, take notice of, of the people that were involved in, in this project. So uh, luckily we were not the only ones that uh, thought of this and we were able to partner up with specifically Ludovica Seratrice in the University of Reading, who was already working uh, on, on a, a similar study um, all over the UK and Ireland. So she was already uh, in uh, partnering with other institutions. Um, and of course, uh, I could not move forward without saying that even though I might be the singing voice of this study today, uh, this could have not been possible without the help and support of my wonderful colleagues, uh, uh, Lee Chun Liu and uh, Elizabeth Lanza, uh, who both of you you've heard today already. Okay, so what started as a simple curiosity question and a need to make sense of an unbearable situation um, had actually a pretty big impact in our lives too. Um, so we were lucky to not only catch the attention of international researchers across the world, but also of a wonderful writer, uh, Sophie, who decided to write a piece for the New York Times. Um, and she being a mother of a multilingual child herself, she felt deeply connected to what we were trying to do. Um, and so the article uh, mentioned different research uh, on the effects of the pandemic in language in, in different uh, parts of the world. And so I, um, you know, one of the things that I mentioned in this article and also that uh, it's really the, the one of the, the forces why we decided to study this um, is because, you know, when, when you think about uh, raising, when you think about living in a different country and raising your child uh, with your native language, some people think that it's just the most natural thing uh, ever and, and that it's easy because it's your native language, but we know that this is not realistic, right? It's actually quite hard as we've heard today. Um, and so something that we know about multilingual children uh, is that very often when they grow up and they start going to school, uh, the language of the home or the heritage language becomes less and less important. It sort of takes a back seat. And so in a time where all of this uh, schooling and socializing was happening at home uh, and with the parents, we wonder um, how had that impacted uh, these languages? And so we collected, um, uh, we, we performed an online survey and we collected around 200 respon responses all over uh, Norway. So it was parents responding about their family sort of uh, language situation. Um, and I'm glad to say that we had over 45 languages represented in the question. And of course it was a big representation of um, uh, European languages, but we also had languages from, uh, you know, from Southeast Asia, like uh, Hindi and Tagalog, and uh, also from Africa, like Zulu or Africans. Um, and the families were also pretty diverse in terms of the ages of the children, um, because we had from newborns to kids that were already in school. And so um, one of the things that I would really like to stress uh, is the level of the degree of multilingualism of uh, some of these families. So the vast majority of these families had at least two languages at home, meaning uh, probably Norwegian and then uh, another language. Um, but there was also uh, families that had from three to even four or five languages, uh, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, and we also had a pretty good representation of um, different areas in Norway. Um, of course, Oslo was the, the most represented area, not only in terms of 
the the population size, but also because it's inherently very multilingual, multicultural uh, area. Um, and so the survey had around uh, about three sections, um, and I'm not going to talk about everything today because there's tons of questions and tons of interesting uh, results, but I'm going to focus on one or two questions per section. So we uh, question parents about uh, their, their beliefs about multilingualism. We also um, ask them about language use in the family during the lockdown, and finally, uh, they what the impact of uh, the closure of schools and social distancing measures had had in uh, their family languages and their and their uh, families in general. So I would like to start with uh, one of, in my opinion, one of the most interesting questions, which was the question about uh, multilingualism uh, in terms of how they uh, they saw themselves within multilingualism. So. Um, the vast majority of, of these families uh, consider that being multilingual was regarded as very important uh, for their child's and their own identity. Um, so I think it's it's quite remarkable that you know these parents were were not only expressing that it was very important for them to be multilingual, but also for their children. And I think it says a lot that if you yourself are uh, believe that multilingualism is a very important part of your identity, you're also probably more likely to pass on that to your children uh, and really stress that, uh, uh, you know, this resilience that we were talking about before. Um, and so when it came to language use during the, lock the lockdown, um, one of the things that I found uh, pretty interesting as well was uh, how parents talk about uh, reading uh, to their children. So of course, you know, depending on whether the children were able to uh, read by themselves already or whether it was parents reading to their children. Um, but they reported that they read to their children in Norwegian uh, as often as in other languages, which I think is also uh, pretty extraordinary um, because obviously the Norwegian is a language of education, but these parents were trying to really put stress on, on, the, other, uh, on the other languages, the home languages as well. Um, and I think something that I found very interesting is uh, that English had a very big presence uh, on online spaces, whether that was television or uh, playing computer games, uh, um, that we'd really see a, a, a big representation of, of English. And I think, you know, talking about, for instance, our collaborators in the in the UK, uh, I think the situation can be quite different there uh, in the sense that Norway is already uh, a place where English has a, a space uh, from television and so on, but also many of the families that participated in this in this study uh, were probably speaking English between uh, between the two parents. So that is the, all these, uh, you know, sources of English that are present at the home and uh, definitely takes a pretty big space. And uh, lastly, but not less importantly, I would like to stress uh, the perhaps biggest finding, which really was our main research question, which was, uh, you know, we asked parents uh, whether uh, the lockdown and homeschooling had had a, a positive effect on home languages. Um, and so knowing that families who are raising multilingual children uh, and knowing that the, these home languages tend to move to a second place um, as children grow older, uh, we we did really see a pretty uh, straightforward yes when it came to to them referring to a positive effect on the home languages. Um, however, it's important to also stress that, um, as I mentioned earlier, there was a great deal of variation when it came to uh, the, the families that we had in terms of linguistic and cultural background. But if we divide families between those that had um, Norwegian at home and those that did not have Norwegian at home, uh, whether that was because none of the parents was a Norwegian speaker or they didn't feel comfortable enough to kind of speak it on a regular basis, uh, they did report a negative effect on their Norwegian. So even though we do see an overall positive effect on home languages, some families really struggle with, uh, with, their, with their access to Norwegian. And you have to understand that for some of these families, um, just, you know, going to work and going to school might be the only source of of Norwegian in their lives. So they definitely were impacted um, um, by the lockdown, of course. And I'm sure they continue to be. 
Um, so I would like to to end a, with a uh, by highlighting one of the questions of the survey, which was also highly uh, uh, commented in the newspaper coverage, which is the question of well-being. And so we asked parents as well whether they thought that multilingualism was a source of well-being in their family. Uh, a question for which we also uh, found a great deal of positive agreement. Um, so there's something that I would like to uh, leave you reflecting on today, that in a time where both physical and emotional well-being have been put in such jeopardy, um, is language something that can bring you comfort and release? Um, I think well-being and coming home can certainly come in many shapes and forms. Uh, and I hope that you have the opportunity to reflect on this yourself. Um, but so if we go back to that quote that I introduced you to at the beginning, um, I would really like to make it my own and I would like you to make it all of your own uh, by remembering that place does not have to be a physical place, certainly not now. Um, and that if you embrace your linguistic identity and, uh, and your cultural identity, language can actually something that can take you home. Um, so on that, I hope positive note, uh, I'm leaving you here today. Uh, thank you so much for letting me uh, be part of this event. And also thank you everyone who is watching. Uh, if you have any comments, I'm here to uh, discuss it with you and you can always contact me personally.